we're past 35, so. Hi everyone, welcome back to our Wednesday lunch talks. Maybe you've all got your lunch with you, maybe not, but we have two wonderful talks lined up. So without further ado, let's get started. Our first speaker today is Dr. Kari Kolyonen. He graduated from the Alto University School of Electrical Engineering in 2013 and started his first postdoc at the Alto University Metsohovi Radio Observatory. In 2014, he moved to the New York University Abu Dhabi to work with Dr. Dave Russell. He's currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Finnish Center for Astronomy with ISO, where he has worked since 2016. He has also been at the CFA previously, so some of you might remember him. Uh, because he was a pre-doc here uh, between 2007 and 2008. Um, his research is concentrated on the link between accretion and jet formation around neutron stars, stellar mass, and supermassive black holes using multi-wavelength observations. Uh, his other research uh, includes using novel data analysis methods in timing and spectral domains to study the X-ray spectra and light curves of microquasars. So please, take it away. Thank you, Rotu, uh, and thanks the organizers for inviting me to talk to you about um, recent events um, that is going on in Geos 1915. All right, let me make this one first, and here we go. Everybody see the slides? Yes. Great. So, um, just before starting, I'd like to mention two, uh, two people that I've been working with this topic. Um, first of all, Dalviki Hovatta, who is working here uh, at the University of Turku and Finca. And then uh, John Tomsik from Space Science Lab, uh, Berkeley. Um, so basically, uh, 1915 is uh, x-ray binary, so I, because this is a, a astroph high energy astrophysics group, I think everybody knows what, what's an x-ray binary. And in particular, I'm interested in the outburst phase of an x-ray binary. Um, and the outburst happen when the matter accumulates in the accretion disk, resulting in a thermal instability that effectively increases the mass accretion rate towards the black hole. Um, and that matter then radiates um, intensely, mainly in X-rays, and also with combination uh, to the magnetic fields in the accretion disk. Um, the inflowing matter also get ejected um, in, in the jets, and, and which we observe um, typically in the radio. So here is. Uh, uh, X-ray light curve uh, of a typical low mass X-ray binary, 817.43, minus 3 to 2, uh, where we see that these outbursts are transient events. Um, and typically, they rise in hours or days. And they last about weeks, a few weeks, or a few months. Uh, but Cheers 1915 is a, a different kind of beast. Um, um, it's a bit peculiar system. Um, it is a low mass X-ray binary, um, but the orbit of this binary is the longest that we know of, about 34 days. Uh, it consists of a 12 solar mass black hole and a K-type giant companion with a mass of about a half a solar mass. Um, and this long um, period uh, causes or allows the accretion this crow very large, as can be seen here on the, on the right-hand side figure, that the accretion disk is actually the largest out of all the X-ray binaries. Of course, all the X-ray binaries is not depicted here or just a collection of them. Um, and when you have a, a huge accretion disk, um, this also allows uh, very long outbursts. And in fact, uh, 1915 started with outburst in 1992, and it has been going ever since for almost three decades. 
Now, it typically um, in uh, outbursts from low mass X-ray binary, uh, the source starts first at uh, very low accretion rate and very low X-ray luminosity, uh, rapidly rises to about 20% um, of heading accretion rate at the peak or a little bit more, um, and then uh, decays back to the uh, quiescent state. Uh, while if we look at the X-ray light curve of 1915, here at the below, we see that essentially uh, all the lifetime of ASM on board uh, RXTE and, and MAXI at the I, um, industrial ISS, uh, we see that the source is accreting at the 20% Eddington up to uh, Eddington or even in some cases super Eddington accretion rates. So essentially we are here at the top of the outburst. Many of you probably know 1915 also as the first superluminal mo uh, motion detected in a galactic source um, where we have the apparent velocity of the jet um, running at 1.15. Uh, the speed of flight, which relates to intrinsic velocity of the jet of about 0.7 C or so. And the radio emission is also very transient uh, for 1915. Uh, as we see here, it's uh, 10 years of radio monitoring data and we see that the um, transient jet is observed um, almost regularly every year. Um, and it lasts about a few months and then uh, the source band that low radio emission levels, uh, it's not completely quenched, but uh, at a level of 10 to 50 millijanskis. While during the transient jet events uh, where we see the blobs emanating from the source, uh, the flux densities of the radio uh, reach uh, half a jansky. And this is a very bright, bright jet what comes to uh, other X-ray binaries. Now, those of you who know your modified Julian dates uh, probably noticed that I left something out of this plot. Um, this is plotted only uh, about 2018. And if we include uh, the observations up to um, Today, we see that the uh, X-ray flux dropped dramatically. So from 20% of Eddington accretion rate, it went to about 4% Eddington rate and then even lower to about 1% Eddington accretion rate. Um, so this raises the question that uh, are we now wit witnessing the end of the outburst? Is it finally coming down? Uh, after uh, being at the outburst for 30 years. So this figure is a zoom up for the, for the outburst decay, uh, which is uh, between these uh, two dashed and dashed dot lines. Uh, we had a campaign at ALMA, so the millimeter telescope, um, uh, two observations during the outburst decay. Uh, and we see that the, from the AMI monitoring data that the flux density in the radio is basically zero. So we are getting very little radio emission, uh, which we haven't seen before. And as I mentioned earlier, we are also getting a lower X-ray emission than ever seen before. And then after a while, when the X-ray flux dropped even more from about 4% of Eddington to 1% of Eddington, we see the radio flaring again. Uh, seen here at the right upper corner of the figure uh, that we are getting radio flares up to 0.3 Chanskis. So the, this raises the question of what is going on? Uh, is the how, outburst decaying or not, or 
what uh, if the source went back on or what is going on. So together with Alma and nicer observations, um, we published a study uh, during this outburst decay and all, all the X-ray and radio properties point out to the fact that, that this outburst decay is a, a sort of classical hard state of X-ray binaries, which is always seen uh, when an X-ray binary outburst goes um, the case and goes into the question. So I will go briefly through all of the uh, results pointing towards um, the hard state. So first of all, of course, when the outburst decays, we ha have X-ray luminosity decreasing. It typically decreases uh, first exponentially and then linearly, as shown here. Um, and also the hardness increases, so um, which can be seen in the left-hand side plot, which plots the hardness ratio, uh, the x-axis and the x-ray flux, uh, the uh, uh, y-axis. And we see that the first the source is um, at the left upper corner. This is the outburst phase. Uh, the luminosity is between 10 to 10% uh, to Eddington. And then when the source uh, starts its decay, uh, the luminosity and the hardness increases. Um, and also in fact, when it um, lowers even more to what is called um, here as an obscured state, uh, the uh, average luminosity is about 1% of Eddington. So we looked at the um, uh, X-ray properties uh, first uh, and the timing uh, properties. So typically in the X-ray uh, hard state um, has um, corona or the optically thin inner accre accretion flow, um, which where there is a propagating fluc fluctuations that produced a band limited noise in the X-ray power density spectrum which is depicted in, here in blue. And accompanying that is a quasi-periodic oscillation um, that is thought to arise from a truncation radius of the disk. So that when the outburst decays, the accretion disk or the uh, Shakura Sunyev disk um, retreats and it gets replaced um, by the optically uh, thin flow. So we, we can actually see this in the X-ray power density spectrum uh, as a green line. So this is the uh, optically thick, geometric thin accretion disk uh, producing a flicker noise right at the beginning of the exponential decay. Um, and then when the decay progresses, uh, it gets removed from from the X-ray regime. And we see only the band limited noise in the QPO. And when the uh, source um, goes into the so-called obscured state, we see a progressively uh, a red noise, power law noise dominating the, or becoming dominating component of the power density spectrum. So this indicates a scattering process. Uh, so this is, um, so the band limited noise on type C QPO is very typical for uh, X-ray binary hard state and we see it uh, during the outburst decay here as well. Uh, the X-ray spectrum from the optically uh, thin um, out, uh, inner flow uh, is com Comptonization and it's a power law with the index of about 1.5, and this is exactly what we are seeing uh, at the nicer spectra of GS 1915. So we can take that out as well. Um, and then from our AMA observations, uh, which were taken at uh, three millimeter or a hundred uh, gigahertz in frequency, um, 
we have two side bands and these side bands help us to uh, measure the radio spectrum in this band and it turned out to be fairly flat. Um, so in our two observations, uh, we had uh, minus 0.1 uh, or plus 0.1. So basically a flat uh, jet, uh, which is expected uh, in a hard state actually binary as well. Uh, we also detected linear polarization at the fraction of 1%, uh, very typical values for X-ray binaries as well. And lastly, um, we collected uh, uh, millimeter observations taken in, uh, uh, sim uh, in a similar low radio states, uh, in addition to our own observations uh, from NMA and JCMT. And if we line these up into a X-ray radio correlation plot, uh, we see that they line up fairly well and with an index that is very similar to other hard state X-ray binaries, indicating that um, readily inefficient accretion is taking place at the source, which, which also indicates that the, it's the, the emission comes from the corona that feeds um, matter into the jets. So we can um, say that the hard state is what, what has taken place at the source during the decay of the X-ray flux. Now a little bit more detail what, what happened after the decay. So from the X-ray flux um, or X-ray light curve, we see that there is a small rebrightening, uh, which we call here uh, rebrightening state. And <clears throat> from detailed uh, modeling, uh, we see that the absorption of heavy elements increase at the rebrightening state. Uh, and also from the X-ray spectrum, um, depicted here, we see that the equivalent widths of the absorption line increase for iron 26 and 25. Um, and this indicates the presence of increased cooler material in the lines of, line of sight. So something is coming between or something is thickening, becoming more dense in our line of sight to the central source. Now when the source then goes to the obscured state, um, the flux dropped by a factor of five from the linear decay if it is extrapolated from, from the uh, decay profile or even more if you uh, consider the rebrightening state. Was that three minutes? Yes. Ah, okay, thanks. Um, and then the absorption lines turn to emission. And this indicates obscuration of the interesting emission. Um, so what is this obscuring material then? Uh, it might be the accretion disquint. There was a paper by John Miller et al. in 2020, where they had Chandra observations uh, of 1915, and they were able to study uh, detail, in detail fashion the absor iron absorption lines and found out that the profile matches uh, what they called a failed wind. So accretion disk wind that doesn't make it to infinity, uh, but, but maybe it is free accreted to, or at least uh, it's blocking some of our view to the central source. And when the source goes to obscure day, state, this failed wind can become, uh, well, not failed, but, uh, but accretion disk wind that is Compton thick, um, that is obscuring uh, the central source, or maybe this is some sort of disk warp or uh, geometrical change in the accretion disk that, is, uh, it pro that can happen when the source transits to the uh, hard state. Uh, some words about recent multivalent uh, monitoring observations. Uh, this is a paper published by Sara Motta et al, uh, where 
uh, they were looking at um, uh, X-ray monitoring data uh, and radio monitoring data of 1915 up to today. Uh, and we see that the radio flaring conti still continues um, while the X-ray emission is at a very low level. And if we, they, they were suggesting that, that if the source um, traverses this same path in the X-ray radio diagram, um, but then the radio is very luminous, uh, this might mean that the, the amount of X-rays that are absorbed is about 200, a factor of 200. So this would mean that the 1915 is accreting at the super Eddington level, uh, but something is obscuring our view to the source. Uh, on the other hand, maybe the, the obscuration is not as high, um, but the, the radio emission is, comes from a more efficient energy dissipation. So for example, if there, there's a lot of material uh, in the way of the jet, it uh, produces shocks and therefore more efficient energy dissipation and radioluminosity. Now, one interesting hint about the intrinsic luminosity of the source happened when the so um, uh, source softened a bit, so the spectrum become, became thermal. Um, and it seems that the spectrum is not absorbed at all. Uh, so there is not indication of high absorption at the soft end here. Um, and this went up to uh, the same level as observed with the outburst decay, so 4% of Eddington. Um, so this is just an example in their paper that the red spectra here was uh, observed at the thermal state during outburst and the magenta spectra here was during the soft state during the decay. Uh, and these types of excursions to soft state uh, are typical uh, for X-ray binaries mm, during their uh, decay, outburst decay. So uh, uh, very quickly um, about the super Eddington accretion and comparing this to the 4046 outburst. Um, so we published with John Tomsic last year a paper where we compared uh, X-ray spectra from SIG X3, 3446, 3461 Sagittarius and 1915. And these spectra look suspiciously uh, similar. So maybe they share similar physical conditions. Uh, these are all high inclination sources. Uh, for SIG X3, the companion star is the Wolf Rayet and, and the black hole actually uh, orbits uh, inside the stellar wind of the Wolf Ray, so there uh, is most likely a strong reprocessing going on. Uh, V4046 and V4641 Sagittarius are uh, known super Eddington accretors, and in this accretion uh, rates, the uh, inner accretion flow becomes uh, what is the so called slim disk and puff up and also produces obscuration of the of the innermost accretion flow. So we fitted all these uh, spectra for all these sources uh, with obscured, reflected, and aging torus scenarios. Uh, while these are different scenarios, they all share strong obscuration. And perhaps the most important results concerning 1915 was that during the obscured state, this model is suggested the source is only accreting at a few percent of Eddington. While we um, found out for V4046, for example, that it is accreting at the super Eddington level. So this suggests also that perhaps the obscured state is not as luminous as um, we think. So to conclude, um, 1915 certainly exhibited the hard state based on X-ray properties and radio properties. Uh, and the source is currently uh, obscured. But now the question is that how much it is obscured? And this is of course a difficult to answer because it's model uh, dependent. It might be only a factor of five or so, uh, indicates that the source is in a hard state, Pro probably indicates that the outburst is ending at the near future. 
but if it's a factor of 200, this indicates superadding and accretion, um, maybe the outburst is continuing behind um, the veil of accretion disk or Compton thick wind. And this raises also the question that was the 1992 start of the outburst actually the start of the outburst or just the removal of obscuration? Because of the so large accretion disk, it has a lot of material for, uh, uh, for the outburst. And it's theoretically reasonable that the outburst lasts uh, several decades, even hundreds, hundred years. And also interesting is because of this accretion, large accretion disk, we are seeing the events progress at uh, slower time scales as for smaller disks. So maybe all of this is happening also in X-ray binaries, but on a faster time scales. And lastly, there might be an important connection to obscured AGN. Uh, that perhaps the obscure, not not all, but some of the obscured AGN might be. Uh, exhibiting uh, similar effects so that they are obscured by by a wind or uh, some disk um, uh, geometrical effect. So at the moment we stand at crossroad. Uh, we're not really sure that the outburst is ending or if the outburst continues. If I were a betting man, I would put my money on the outburst is ending. Uh, it's not certain. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kari, for a great talk. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two quick questions. Uh, please, if you have questions, you can raise your hand in the chat, or sorry, raise your hand or put your question in the chat. I am not seeing any questions. Uh, Peter, Federico, any chance people are sending questions directly to you or? Uh, there's a chat from John Raymond. Oh, okay, yeah, that hadn't turned up for me, thank you. Um, John Raymond asks, uh, other Super Eddington systems show strong winds. Is there any indication? Um, yes, so. 1915 is um, famous for its wind, uh, which which is observed in the in the outbursts during the outbursts. Uh, um, it's not clear if there are uh, winds uh, in the obscured state. That is something that uh, needs to be studied yet. Uh, but it might be that if the if the wind is Compton thick, then it just becomes an obscuring thing, and and any indication of uh, absorption lines then it's, uh, disappeared. Thank you. Um, any other questions? All right, I don't see any others. Uh, but if you if you have any more questions, our speakers uh, meeting schedule still has several open spot, uh, spots. So please go sign up. And I will turn it over to Peter now. Thank you again, Kari. Thanks. All right. Our next speaker is Lindsay Glazner. Uh, Lindsay Glazner earned her undergraduate degree in physics at San Francisco State University and her PhD in physics at the University of California in Berkeley in 2012. She joined the faculty of University of Minnesota as an assistant professor in the School of Physics and Astronomy in late 2015. Dr. Glazner analyzes data from ground-based and space-based solar observatories and develops technology for new instruments. She is the principal investigator for X-ray instruments that fly on sounding rockets and small CubeSats to study the sun. Um, so uh, without further, further ado, please begin. Sorry, I shared screen and the mute button moved on me. I have a hard enough time finding it as it is. Uh, okay, I hope that everybody can see my screen now. If, if you can't, then definitely let me know. 
and thanks very much for inviting me to give this lunchtime seminar. I sure wish I could come visit you in person, but I will hope to do that as soon as the pandemic is over. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be talking about studying small scale energy releases on the sun, uh, specifically in making hard X-ray measurements from small solar flares. And I'm largely going to be centering on new star and FOXY data with some supporting multi-wavelength data observations as well. So here's an outline of my talk. Um, I'll discuss really briefly some of the science questions that we're looking at uh, when we're investigating the high energy sun. Uh, and then going to dive into the observations and show you some observations, both from the FOXY sounding rocket and from the New Star Observatory. Uh, the, the physics of what I'm going to talk about is largely in the third point here. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of a sense of what we're starting to learn about the energetics of solar flares from looking at the small ones in comparison to the, the big ones. And then um, if there's time at the end, I, I've got a little bit of a, a bonus topic here. Uh, which is to talk about one particular issue that you run into when you're taking your instrument into a pretty extreme environment, which I think everybody would agree the sun is a somewhat extreme environment. Uh, okay, so I, I, let me start out with my, my little slide I like to do plugging um, how nice it is to be able to study an astrophysical object that is relatively close to you, only 90 million miles away. And it's a little bit ironic that I'm starting the talk with this, but I'm going to end by talking about one of the difficulties you run into when you're studying an astrophysical object that is pretty close. Uh, but there are a lot of nice aspects to this. Um, for one, you have a lot of multi-wavelength data because we've got a lot of instruments that are optimized for and pointing at the sun across the entire magnetic spectrum. We don't have all of those energy ranges covered really well. And we definitely don't have them covered well all of the time. Uh, but large and, large and beyond, there are a lot of instruments that you can use for any particular observation. Sometimes you get a chance to measure the particles that come out at you, not just the photons. And there are certainly plenty of people at the, the CFA who are involved in investigations to look at those. Uh, sometimes you can get an alternate viewing angle, uh, because occasionally you've got a spacecraft that is not at, at the Earth and can see it from another angle. And that gives you an opportunity to try to do a 3D reconstruction. And uh, this is a particularly exciting topic in hard X-ray solar flare observations now, because we're starting to get data from the STIX instrument on Solar Orbiter. Uh, but that's a, a separate topic and I'm not gonna have time to talk about that. Uh, and then lastly, I wanna make the case that this is a, a nice regime to study in because you have the opportunity to study events across a, a pretty wide range of different energy scales. And that means that you're not limited to just studying the biggest and brightest events, the ones that you see on TV. Uh, but you can also look at the, the smaller events, the fainter events, the less energetic energy releases. And you can try to see what the, the universal properties are and how they scale. Uh, this is important because we, we sometimes have a little bit of a suspicion when it comes to the sun. Uh, that big flares might not be representative of, of most flares. And we don't really know at the moment whether they are or whether they're not. Um, we know, do know that a lot of the big flares are associated with big coronal mass ejections as well. And that's certainly not something that happens for most flares, or at least we don't know that it does. Um, so that's one aspect already in which um, big flares might be a little bit pathological. Okay, so what sorts of questions are we looking at on the sun? Well, we'd love to understand how flares accelerate particles. Uh, that's one of the main things that we're looking at. We'd like to find out what causes plasma jets to shoot out from the corona. Uh, and these do, depending on the magnetic field structure, these jets uh, often do make it to interplanetary space. Um, so that's an avenue for energy and particles to escape into the heliosphere. Uh, we'd like to really understand the connection between solar flares and coronal mass ejections when you have these large masses of plasma leaving the sun. Uh, those are, of course, the drivers of space weather that can affect the Earth. Uh, we often think of these as two different sides of the same coin, uh, but there are a lot of open questions about how related they are. Does one trigger the other? Are they two things that have to happen together, or are they just things that tend to show up in the same time in the same place. 
We'd like to know what heats the corona, be it a whole bunch of small nano flares happening all over the sun, be it wave heating or something else. And perhaps related to that, we'd also like to know what accelerates the solar wind. Uh, so these are all questions that we tend to look at using hard x-rays. Uh, and there are some hard x-rays in this image. Uh, this is actually new star data, the, the new star data, the, the blue fuzzy blobs here. Uh, on top of data from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, that's largely the red colors, the extreme ultraviolet, and there's also Hinode X-ray Telescope XRT data in green on top of this as well. So we're combining a lot of high energy data here. Um, I'm going to concentrate on this topic only for this talk, and I, I, I'm not really going to answer that question at all, but I'll, I'll tell you in what ways we're investigating this. Uh, so just a little bit of background for those who aren't used to looking at the sun. Um, I think probably everyone here knows what a solar flare is, but let me tell you my definition of it, which is that it's a very impulsive burst of radiation on the sun or on another star if we're talking about a stellar flare. Uh, and this radiation can really be across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, we see some flares in essentially every wavelength frequency or energy that you look at, depending on which of those variables you choose to parameterize against. Uh, we think that solar flares arise from reconnection in the magnetic fields of the corona. And their ability to accelerate particles is extremely uh, capable and extremely efficient. So in a large solar flare, we could get up to 10 to the 32 ergs going into accelerated electrons alone. Uh, and that could be approximately half the energy of the flare. It's more or less depending on the event, but oftentimes it's about half. The individual particles can get up to very high energies, uh, at least to MeV scales for electrons and GeV scales for protons, but probably a lot higher than that as well. And we can take a look at these processes by using soft and hard X-rays. Uh, and that's largely because we get a lot of thermal and non-thermal Bremsstrahlung from flares. So for non-thermal electrons, looking at the hard X-ray Bremsstrahlung that comes out of them is one of the most direct diagnostics we've got. And that's largely because there's not much else happening in the hard X-ray regime. It's mostly Bremsstrahlung. Uh, at lower energies, you let's say the low end of the hard X-ray band and in the soft energies, uh, we get thermal Bremsstrahlung and we also get some line emission there. Um, since nobody ever mm -hmm. agree, agrees on these concepts, I'm gonna point out that for for my talks, I tend to refer to hard x-rays as being above about a few kV, and this is mostly Bremsstrahlung, and soft x-rays is kind of everything below that, uh, which means if we're talking about, let's say, the lower energies of new stars energy band, uh, we have arguments about whether that's actually hard x-rays or soft x-rays, but that's an argument for another time. And I do want to em emphasize that largely what we're looking at here is Bremsstrahlung. There's a little bit of line emission as well, but the rest of it is Bremsstrahlung. Uh, I mentioned that because I've occasionally had a conversation with non-solar astrophysicists in which it took us about 15 minutes into the conversation to realize that we were talking about different emission mechanisms. Okay, so with, with this technique, uh, what sorts of things can we look at, um, or rather what instruments can we use to look at the sun? Um, let me introduce the two instruments that I'll be showing you observations from in this talk. Both of these instruments are direct focusing hard X-ray instruments that use mirrors to reflect X-rays. And this gets us orders of magnitude better sensitivity than we could with previous indirectly observing instruments. On the left here, I have some information about the FOXY sounding rocket. Uh, this is a sounding rocket experiment that has now flown, flown for three flights. Uh, each of them is about six minutes, and you can see that they have taken place at very different times within the, the last solar cycle. So we actually observed flares in the 2012 and 2014 flights, uh, very small flares, micro flares, uh, but we didn't get any flares in the 2018 flight. It, it was a, a very quiet time of the solar cycle. Uh, as a side note, I'll mention that we are planning to fly FOXY again in 2024. And for that flight, we're actually going to aim to try to measure a big solar flare. Uh, Kathy Reeves from the CFA is part of that effort to try to bring about a, a solar flare rocket campaign. Uh, so stay tuned and invite me back in 2025. Uh, okay, so one thing I want to point out about FOXY is that this is an instrument that was optimized 
especially to look at the sun. So that's its only purpose in life. Um, and we were looking mainly for indicators of nanoflares and coronal heating. But as I mentioned, we did manage to get some actual individual microflares as well. On the right side of this slide, I've got information about New Star, which is, of course, an astrophysics spacecraft uh, not optimized to look at the sun, although it does look at the sun sometimes. Um, and because it's not optimized for this purpose, the best conditions are really very quiet solar conditions. Uh, so solar minimum, for example, looking at the quiet sun, uh, looking at quiescent active regions that aren't flaring much, or maybe regions that are just putting out uh, the small micro flares that are of interest for this talk. Okay, so let me give you an idea of um, where we are with what we've observed so far in very small solar flares from the sun with Foxy and New Star. I'm not going to concentrate much on the physics of this plot, but I want to show this to you briefly in order to give you an idea of where we are compared with other instruments that have done this. Uh, the other instruments are these clouds of red and blue up here in the upper right. Uh, I'm hoping you can see my cursor, and I'm also hoping you'll tell me if you can't. Uh, red is RESI, and blue is the, the GOES X-ray instrument. And then uh, you can see that down here in this lower left corner of the plot, are the observations from New Star and Foxy. Now this is emission measure versus temperature using an isothermal approximation. So pretending for the time being that there is only one temperature in a flare. Uh, that's a, a vastly incorrect approximation, but just bear with me for this slide. And so this is basically telling who, how bright the plasma is and at what temperature. Um, compared to Resi and Goes, you can see we're way down here. So we are getting to much, much fainter scales than we have been in the past. Um, one of the questions we ask as we look at these small micro flares is how similar are they to the larger flares that we observed with the RESI instrument, for example? And so there's just been published a, a study of 11 new star micro flares by Jesse Duncan, who's a grad student at the University of Minnesota. And she went through and did a, a very thorough characterization of the time evolution the spatial configuration and the spectra of these flares. When she looked at the time profiles, uh, what she found is that a lot of these flares display properties that are very similar to larger flares observed by previous instruments. Uh, and that is, for example, we see evidence of impulsive heating at the beginning of the flare. So you see the, the high energy starting to peak first, and then you see a slow decay that kind of trails out to lower and lower energies after that. Uh, we think that happens because you dump the energy in at the very beginning of the flare and then the rest of the evolution is due to the gradual cooling. Uh, Jesse observed high energy spectral excesses in all of these events over an isothermal distribution. So as I told you on the previous slide, even for very small energy releases like this, an isothermal approximation is just not a good one. Uh, and so, so far I'd have to say that by and large, uh, the aspects of small flares that we're observing are very similar to larger flares. What's more, small micro flares can have accelerated electrons. Uh, this is an example from a paper that we published last year, uh, and this is our clearest observation of a non-thermal electron distribution in a micro flare that was observed with New Star. Uh, this image here in the upper left shows you the active region on the sun that this is coming from, and this is extreme ultraviolet data in the background. New star contours are in pink, and then we have EOV, some microwave emission uh, from in shown in blue as well. The flare is over here, and there's a zoom in of the flare right next to this so that you can see what the new star emission looks like in two different energy bands. Uh, we've run several iterations to deconvolve the new star point spread function from this image. So we're really trying to get down to the limits of what the new star resolution can give us here. Uh, but you can see that you actually do get a, a kind of nice loopy shape here that matches up fairly nicely with the EUV image in the background. Uh, when we look at the, the spectra, uh, we do find a pretty clear observation here of a non-thermal power law. And this power law extends down to pretty low energies as compared with, with bigger flares, all the way down to about 6 kV, which is very low for a solar flare. Uh, but it makes sense that we might see that now that we have the sensitivity to actually look at this in mild, mildly energetic events like this. 
And so how does this non-thermal energy that we saw in this flare compare with larger flares? Uh, well, let me show you a, a study that looks at that scaling. Uh, this is a study by Varmuth and Mann that was published in 2016. And they used Resi and GOES data to look at the thermal radiation that was observable in X-rays versus the non-thermal radiation, uh, sorry, the non-thermal energy that they observed in X-rays. Uh, so this thermal energy on the y-axis is not the total thermal energy of the flare, it's just the thermal energy that is observable in X-rays. Uh, there's more thermal energy than that if we go to the lower wavelengths as well. Uh, what they found in this study was that by and large, as you go from large flares in the upper right here to smaller flares in the lower left, uh, the non-thermal energy gets closer and closer to matching the thermal energy. At larger scales, the non-thermal energy is much larger. So what it looks like here is that flares are getting relatively less energetic as we go down in scale, uh, relatively less non-thermally energetic as we go down in scales. Uh, but if I use PowerPoint magic to put the new star flare on top of that, uh, we find that it doesn't fit that trend. It's hanging out here in a part of parameter space that is not well represented on this plot. And in considering the previous studies and the limitations of the instruments that were used in that studies, uh, we are coming to the conclusion uh, that this part of the parameter space just might not be able to be explored very well by those previous instruments. Uh, so this is really a place where New Star and Foxy are telling us something new, or at least hinting that there is different behavior out here from what we thought before. Of course, you know, one flare does not a power law make, and so it, it's hard to draw firm conclusions on that from this one observation. And um, just to uh, go a little bit further, we do know from radio observations that there are non-thermal electrons associated with small flares quite commonly. And just as an example here, I'm showing you a new star observation from April 2019. You can see a, a little micro flare right here and several energy bands. And at the time, there are several type three radio bursts that are observed by the fields instrument on the Parker Solar Probe, uh, which at this point in time is located pretty close to the sun. And those type three radio bursts are coherent emission from uh, escaping electron beams from the sun. We can kind of trace their uh, evolution outwards as they travel towards interplanetary space as we see the frequency drift over time. And so these are known to be associated with accelerated electrons. And here's just one more example of that, uh, this time looking much closer to the sun and actually with some imaging observations. Uh, this isn't a new star event, uh, but this is an observation using the VLA to look at those type three bursts and actually image the emission at the sun. You kind of see all of those electron beams tracing back to this one location here. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap up pretty soon here, but I, I want to make a couple points about this. One being that we're now essentially measuring X-ray microflares on the sun to about five orders of magnitude fainter than we did with previous instruments. Uh, so if we look at this plot, this is now plotting the overall flux at 5 kV of a flare versus the ratio of the flux in two energies. So it's basically a brightness hardness diagram. And these are the, the new star flares, the Foxy flares, and a, a few more new star flares from past studies here. Now, if you draw a, a fit line through all these flares on this plot, uh, what you end up finding is that it falls pretty close to this little data point here in the upper right. And this little data point is our non-thermal flare and we didn't use it to fit that line. Uh, we wanted to see what this distribution looked like without that plot. Uh, but what we find is that that flare kind of falls right on this distribution. So it really indicates that maybe this flare is not very different from the other flares that we're seeing. And there might actually be reason to, to think that there could be more non-thermal behavior in these other flares as well. Uh, there's more information about this in uh, Jesse Duncan's paper in Julie Vivering's dissertation and in a paper that Julie is just about finished with the revision of right now. Okay, uh, so I'm going to finish up with uh, that bonus topic that I mentioned, uh, which is talking about one particular aspect 
where we run into a little bit of trouble when we use new star to look at the sun. Uh, we actually have a lot of ways in which we run into trouble when we use new star to look at the sun. Uh, but we have a lot of those things pretty well characterized by now. And we generally know either how to correct for them or what to avoid if there's something that we can't correct for. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about all of the different issues that we run into, but I wanted to point out one thing uh, that we have discovered just in the last couple of years or so. Uh, and we have um, empirically determined that there is a previously unknown detector issue in that the detector gain on new star can shift by as much of a, as a few percent when you're looking at really, really high count rates. Um, so this, I don't want to scare people with this. Uh, this is not something that needs to be taken into account for the vast majority of new star observations. Uh, this is only when you're getting into those pathological regimes where your lifetime is down to perhaps a percent or even a fraction of per, a percent. Um, and that's a kind of regime we operate in quite a bit when we're making new star solar observations. Um, so this investigation was performed by uh, Jesse Duncan, who, as I mentioned, is a, a grad student at Minnesota, and she's got a description of this in her paper in an appendix. So you can look there for all the details. I'll just show you quickly what that looks like. Uh, if we take a, a new star spectrum from a micro flare from May 2018, uh, this is what happens if we fit that with just a Bremsstrahlen continuum and then allow two emission lines to show up here. Uh, Jesse actually fit the locations of these emission lines. So she, she just allowed them to, to vary and fit them where, wherever XPEC wanted them to. Uh, and what XPEC found was the wrong energies. And so this 3.8 kV line should be a lot closer to 3.9. And this 6.4 kV line, this should be an iron complex that typically shows up from 6.6 .6 to 6.7 kV. Now, I know you might be thinking, well, there are a lot of ways to get 6.4 kV emission from astrophysical sources, uh, like neutral iron emission, for example. Um, and that's something that could happen on the sun. But the thing is that you shouldn't get that in isolation. The big problem here is that we're missing this iron complex line. And this iron complex does not go down to 6.4. Uh, so if we see only a 6.4 line, you know, without a counterpart at, at higher energies, we know that something is wrong. Uh, and so just to give you an idea of what the solution to this is, uh, we tried uh, actually allowing the new star detector gain to vary as we did the fit. And on the left-hand side, you can see what happens if we do a fit uh, using the normal new star detector gain. And this is now not allowing the lines to vary, it's allowing the lines to, to be where our solar models say they should be. And you can see that we're just completely missing those. On the other hand, if we allow the, the gain to be fit as part of the solution, then we get a, a really nice solution with well-distributed residuals across the entire energy range here. Uh, so this particular flare has a, a gain slope shift of about 3% or so. You actually don't have to change the offset at all. It's just the gain slope. Um, and so it's very deterministic in that way. Uh, we don't know what's causing it but it is also not crazy to imagine that there are some issues that could cause a detector to have trouble returning to baseline when it's just being hit with photons all the time. Okay, so with that, I'll sum up. Uh, New Star and FOXY observations are now getting us really several orders of magnitude improved sensitivity. Uh, we only have about 18 minutes so far of FOXY observations of the sun, but we do now have about 23 new star solar observations, and, and most of those are several orbits each. Uh, so we're starting to at least amass enough microflares that we can start to look at collective properties. Um, I don't think we're at the point yet where we can really do true statistical studies yet, but at least we can start to look at it a bit systematically. Uh, what we're seeing so far is that we are seeing very similar behavior in small micro flares as we do in big flares. And in fact, it even turns out that small flares might be able to accelerate electrons with similar efficiency to big flares. And that's really um, a new thing here. This was not thought to be the case in the past. Um, and then, you know, I, I hate to end on a negative note here, but I, I do want to point out the, the bad news, which is that you know, the observations that I'm showing you here are not observations that are really optimized for this purpose. 
So if we do an occasional rocket flight every few years and um, borrow an, uh, somebody else's spacecraft that really isn't built for this purpose, there are fundamental limits to what we can do. So if we do want to get a, a really good systematic wide scale characterization of this across the entire flare range, uh, we're going to need a solar optimized hard X-ray instrument to do that. Uh, it's going to be in space, going to need to be in space because you need to be in space to make these observations. And ideally, I think that this would be part of a multi-wavelength obser observatory uh, that could look at flare particle acceleration and heating across a pretty wide range of energies. Okay, so that's it. I will end there and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, please put them either either raise your hand in the participants window or um, we can read a, a question from the uh, chat window. All right, uh, Kathy Reeves. Hi, Lindsay. Um, for the uh, the flare that you showed, uh, I think it was New Star and it had a non-thermal component um, do you have a, an estimate for what the GOES class of that would have been if GOES could see it, <laughs> which it probably can't? It did. Uh, yeah, GOES could see that one. And oh, okay. it was about an A6 or A7 class flare. Um, I, I will point out that when we get to those GOES classes, the GOES class tends to not mean as much anymore. And that's because there, there tends to be not as a Goes tends to be not quite as goes like as you would expect at those low energies, uh, has been as has been studied by the the Minx team and other teams as well. But yeah, that's about the scale we're looking at is a class. All right, we have a question from the chat uh, from Ed Deluca. Do the electron acceleration observations suggest a cascade model of flare reconnection? A cascade model in that you're looking at reconnection happening in a, a lot of loops in a in an arcade, for example. Yeah, that was that was my thought. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. I actually had a slide on that, and I I took it out, so I shouldn't have. Uh, largely, what we're finding from from all the microflares that we're looking at is that we are still not looking at a single energy release. Uh, so we still see multiple loops involved. I don't suppose you really can't see it here, but even this small event has a whole bunch of different field lines that you see in AIA brightening. Um, and so we're still looking at, we think at least on the order of maybe five energy releases and not just one. So yes, I guess. <laughs> oh, we have one from Paolo Testa. Hi, Lindsay, uh, Paula, thank you for your talk. Um, I am uh, very happy to see all these nice uh, results. Uh, and uh, I'm happy also because uh, you seem to find results which are compatible with our indirect uh, uh, studies of uh, accelerated particles in uh, very small events that uh, we've done with IRIS. So looking at uh, UV spectroscopy and looking at the foot points and looking at, you know, uh, very indirectly modeling uh, the um, uh, the response at uh, the foot points, and we find very similar results. You know, we find that uh, uh, there are not accelerated particles in very small events. We find that uh, the energy cutoff can be of the order of five, ten keV. So that's um, that's very nice. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I, I think what we're starting to see from these first non-thermal observations with with direct hard X-ray instruments, I think that these are agreeing quite nicely with your indirect observations at the foot points. Um, and I, I should probably point out, uh, perhaps this is the best slide to look at. Uh, it's still not quite what I want. Uh, but some of the events in Jesse's paper um, have a, a few microflares where there are iris observations that um, where you've got the slit over the, the flare. Uh, we still have not looked at these in depth yet, so I, I still don't have a good sense of whether we have, say, nice foot point spectra or anything like that. Um, but we've at least got some flares now where there might be an opportunity to do both of those, maybe if the observations allow. Right. With that, we're a bit over. So um, let's thank both of our speakers for some great talks. 
Uh, if you'd like to sign up to uh, do a one-on-one -on -one meeting with either of them, we still have slots in both schedules. And uh, hope to see you all again next week. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank Bye. you both.